the facts are facts now and talk about our global population. It's expected to crack the 10 billion mark. By the way, I wasn't sure what our global population was. 7.97 billion Whoa. around about is how much we have. And we're talking 10 billion by 2050. That's an exponential growth right there. Experts say we'll need to increase food production by 56% to keep up with that demand. Well, that might be kind of a tall order because our food, secu food security is being threatened by climate change. According to a study by the USDA Global, Regional and Local Food Access, will likely be a problem in the decades to come. They predict it will become more difficult to get food from areas that have a surplus and then getting it too quickly to the areas that actually need it. Now, we've already seen harvest loss in the U.S. Just in South Dakota, the grain outlook has dropped by 25 percent. This all factors into a larger global conservation, one that experts are having right now uh, at New York Climate Week, as a matter of fact. We're looking at the importance of uh, addressing food security, global food security, and looking at agriculture as an important part of the solution to addressing the climate crisis and also the biodiversity loss crisis. And to talk more about that, we are joined now by Heather McTeer. Tony, she is the Vice President of Community Engagement at the Environmental Defense Fund. Heather, so good to see you again uh, to talk about another really important topic here. People around the world, right here in the U.S., we don't have to wait for the year 2050, actually, to start seeing problems, you know, when it comes to food. So what are the challenges that we're facing here in the U.S. when it comes to food? Absolutely. Well, hi, Stephanie and Paul. It's great to be back. And I'm coming to you from New York Climate Week uh, here at the Race to Net Zero Forum uh, with Bloomberg Philanthropies. And I can tell you, this is definitely a conversation that we're all trying to figure out right now. The solutions to food production across the United States of America, as well as the global community, is one that is extremely important because you got to eat. You all were talking, my love language a little bit earlier around chocolate. But do you know that with every storm, with every extreme weather event, the impact to food systems is just as important as restoring the infrastructure that we live in. So you got to have air, water, food to live. But how we continue to look at innovative ways to feed people around the world is also an extremely important factor. Mm. Okay, it's a factor right now, but let's talk about in the future and our changing climate. How is that going to kind of make access to nutritious food even more difficult with our changing climate? You know, impoverished communities, uh, minority communities, and communities that are on the front lines of climate change have long been dealing with this issue of food access and food nutrition. Because sometimes when it's easier to go to a McDonald's on the corner versus actually getting nutritious food, there are areas uh, around the world that we call food deserts. These are places where it is uh, you're unable to get access to healthy food within a walking distance, or you are paying more money when you go to get that food. You have to use some transportation source. You have to have a car or use a bus pass. Uh, these types of areas, we're finding it's more, more important to not only focus how we get food to these communities, but also the kinds and the types, making food affordable. That's where the innovation comes in. And that's where it is very important for us to, to look around the places that we are right now and identify if you have a food desert right close to you, why is that? And what are the systems that we need to shift and change in order to make that access to food more um, more, more relatable and yeah. more in a way that people around the world can touch to? You, you mentioned those- But you know, it's interesting. Oh, sorry, Heather, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I think there's a little <laughs> delay there. So I thought you were finished. My apologies on that, go ahead. No worries. I was going to say, you know, it's interesting that we're experiencing that right now in the midst of uh, hurricane season. Unfortunately, across um, the communities in Puerto Rico, they're not only dealing with the devastating impacts of Hurricane Fiona, but also the impacts to their food systems. So this is a very real issue that we're looking at um, and I think have to pay a bit more attention to. Where would you say are the biggest geographic gaps for, you know, when it comes to access to food in the U.S.? In the United States, we absolutely should look to our impoverished, marginalized communities, often on the front lines of climate change. So black and brown communities across the country, indigenous communities, and often places where traditionally food has been not only a part of the culture and lived experience of communities, but something that um, unfortunately sometimes people don't connect to in, in a way that we talk about climate change. So again, going back to those food deserts and accessibility, when we look at 
a corner store in the middle of an urban neighborhood in Chicago. How close are uh, children and elders to being able to get access to celery, carrots, mm -hmm. greens, which are part of the staple in the community versus just picking up chips and potatoes. But that is a really um, important part of, the, of this conversation of food systems and how we think about innovating and the impacts of climate change to the food systems. Yeah. Because again, when farmers are hit um, with flooding, with hurricane, it disrupts the process. And so that also is a part of how we eradicate food disparity across the country and really across the world. Let's talk about the economic impact of those uh, food deserts as well, yeah. where perhaps, you know, a, a dozen apples could cost maybe, you know, $3 in the suburbs, but $9 in a more urban area. What's being done to make sure that for years to come that people have access, affordable access to good, nutritious food? I think you just pointed out, identifying what are the barriers because for that three dollar uh, bag of apples that you can get in a, a suburban market where you can walk to your corner store and pick up the apples um, there's some other elements that we have to calculate for particularly in environmental justice and marginalized communities the transportation costs child care costs if you're able to go to the grocery store in the middle of day versus when you have to go to the grocery store and, and bringing a lot of kids along i can tell you, I can get in and out of the grocery store in three minutes if I don't have any of my kids with me. <laughs> so um, it's it's important to uh, calculate again all of the different costs, child care, security. Let's not forget the devastating um, effect, uh, impact uh, in New York uh, and in communities around the country um, that have seen gun violence in grocery stores targeted to black and brown communities. Yeah. So even in those safe spaces where we can get access to nutritious food, there are other social elements that often we don't Absolutely. attach to climate change. Really good point, but they're Heather. there. Yeah, really, really good point. Thanks for joining us. That's Heather McTeer, Tony, Vice President of Community Engagement at the University.